All right. <laughs> Have a great show going in four, three, two. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody. Burrows and Burbs, episode 102, The Sydney Show. We're in Sydney, Australia today with Dominic Longcroft. Say hello, Dominic. And hello, I've got everybody. my partner in New York, Roberto Cabrera. But he's not in New York, are you? You are slipping I'm away not. with one of those hooky in the Hamptons, but working one of those all day long. Four day weekends that you're uh, prone to do. Yeah. I'm prone to do. <laughs> to that. <laughs> so here we are in Sydney, Australia. Uh, for the first time, we are way, way, way out of our comfort zone. I mean, we've done. Uh, Marbella in Spain, and we've done Norway, but this is a whole nother level of international luxury market exploration. And so I'm very excited, but I am definitely in uncharted territory. Before we begin, I want to thank our sponsor, Grace Farms. Dominic, let me tell you, uh, lean in. I want, I want to tell you about gracefarms.org. If you come to New Canaan, Connecticut, you will see the most incredible modern architecture. It's called the River Building at Grace Farms. But what we're interested in here is not the fantastic architecture or their commitment to e ecology and the environment or art. What we're interested in is their commitment to the sustainable building trades. And they have Design for Freedom, they have a logo and a program, and they are working very hard in the design for freedom space uh, to make, uh, well, to get rid of unfair labor practices in the building trade industry. So for people who want to learn more about that, you can either come to New Canaan, Connecticut, visit their campus, have tea with Frank in the tea house, and learn about design for freedom, or you can go to their website, designforfreedom.org. Okay, Dominic? So okay. got that out of the way. Yeah. Now, it's not so improbable. Let me begin with your introduction. It is not so improbable that you might come visit Grace Farms here in Connecticut because you do split your time between New York and Sydney. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. I do. Uh, two and reasons why I come to New York. One is I have my eldest daughter who lives in the city and uh, is doing a master's and then intends on staying there. And secondly, I am still a broker um, at a real estate firm in New York City. You can He's covering up the one. fact that he comes to visit me in New York. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's my third reason. <laughs> and that's how you two met, right? That's how you came to be on the show, is that you worked on a deal with Roberto not too long ago in Chelsea. And he spoke so highly of you that he said, we've yeah. got to get Dominic on the show. Tell me about how so that impressed. deal went and who well, won. Let me tell you something. Let, let me explain. I, he represented a seller at the Chelsea Mercantile Building, and I had a very dear client, and it was a very specific, you know, was, the negotiation, and she was a very precise person, et cetera, and we went through this negotiation, and Dominic was impeccable in the product, in, in transacting the deal with me. It was really, it was really an amazing thing that we, every single aspect that we had, it was such a professional, and we worked together to make the deal happen, because it wasn't easy. And, uh, and we've maintained a professional relationship ever since. And I, I consider him a dear friend. I, I, and I'm so thrilled that he's succeeding so, so well in Sydney. It's amazing. So welcome here. Thank you, Thank you Roberto. That's very kind. I, I do remember that deal was incredibly um, quick to, to start because I think I listed, you spoke to me um, and I listed the property and I think we had a deal in place uh, on the money side anyway, within three days. Um, yeah. which was incredible. And this property had languished on the market for quite a long time. And I remember because I met the sellers uh, when I was in Aspen and, um, and I met them at the, at the firm that I was working with there. I was doing a presentation and one of the brokers came up to me and said, I've got these sellers and they really want to move to Aspen, but they can't sell their property in Manhattan. Uh, can you help? And I said, sure. So I sat down with them and I did all the comps. And I think I almost um, knocked them off their chairs when I told them what the value of their property was. But they were very gracious and they really wanted to sell. So they took my advice and I went back to New York and then we spoke to each other. And within three days, we, we had a deal together. So they were super happy. Um, and, and I remember that, you know, we, we, we had a, 
we had a, a very, very good um, rapport and really helped our clients get that deal over the table. Yeah. That is a good segue. I'm going to share a screen for just a moment. I found this video on YouTube <laughs> of you. I've done a few of those. <laughs> Not that long ago, and it was really helpful to understand because you, in this video, for only three minutes, and I recommend people just Google your name in YouTube and you'll find the video, um, but it's a very good explanation of the difference between the Australian luxury market and the business in New York and the business in Australia. Could you summarize yeah that for us because you talk about kprs the emphasis on kprs in that video and how that's changed the approach to the business yes so there's a the fundamental difference between uh well there's two fundamental um differences one is the average age of a real estate broker in sydney is around about 30 years old okay so People generally come into this profession after they finish school um, and they essentially decide that that's the career they want to go into. Um, the New South Wales government three, three or almost four years ago took a decision to no longer allow real estate firms to hire new brokers who had never transacted before without giving them what I would call a drawdown which means essentially the firm has to give them money um, before they actually do a deal um, on the premise that they're going to do a deal. So they, are so, they assign them with, uh, with a senior agent um, and essentially they get approximately about 5,000 Australian dollars a month, which equates out to about 3,000 US a month. And that enables the broker to live, they can buy, pay their rent, they can buy their groceries and, um, and they essentially can survive. Before that, there were many, many of these kids who were coming into the profession at around 24, 25, who were going bankrupt because they couldn't get a deal off the ground. They were going into debt and it was a real, becoming a real issue. So um, that's the first main difference is that it's a much younger um, uh, business than, than it is in New York. As we know in New York, most people are coming in as a third or a, a second or a third career. They, they have a long career. And the average age, I remember doing the research a few years ago, is around 60 years old. So it's a very different proposition when you're meeting a real estate broker in New York or you're meeting a real estate. That's right, exactly. I've got the same. Don't worry. Look, there it is. And, and so, and, and then, Roberto, a little bit of a quiff. <laughs> exactly. So... Um, that's the fundamental um, difference that I found when I came to, to, to Sydney. The other difference is, is the way that property is transacted in, 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 in Australia as a whole, and also in New Zealand, is that properties under $5 million are essentially transacted through the auction process. Okay, It's been now the main way to sell your property, the, the, the mainstream, um, you know, um, uh, system of, 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 of the process of selling a property in, uh, in Australia is through the auction process. And it's a six weeks campaign. So essentially, you, you find your broker, you agree, uh, your, 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 your listing agreement, a contract is written up, and which is then advertised out to the potential people who come to the property, unlike New York, where the contract is done after agreement um, between the buyer and the seller. In Sydney and the rest of Australia, the contract is drawn up immediately at the time of the sign of the listing agreement. This is because the contract has to be presented at every open house and every private showing um, at the property so that the, the, the prospective buyer can take that contract, have it sent to him digitally and already send it to his attorney um, before he even makes an offer. So it's a different way of doing it. And the reason is for that, because most of the properties go through auction, you need to remove all the contingencies before the app property goes to auction. And so following on from that, the property would go onto the market. There would be most likely in most cases, two open houses a week, which would last half an hour each. 
that process would go on for a month. So from start to uh, of signing of agreements to actually going to the auction process is one month. Then what happens is an independent auctioneer is invited um, to come and auction the property, usually because most properties in Sydney are in suburbia. So, you know, half acre lots with the property on the front, front yard, backyard, and the the uh, people who are interested to purchase the property would assemble on the front yard. Um, probably a, a good smattering of neighbors would also be there too, because it's in their interest to see what that property goes for. They can immediately then you know, have a value on their property as well, if it's similar. And so therefore after, uh, you know, after, uh, sorry, I've just got to get rid of this. Um, sorry, someone's calling me. Um, so after that process happens, the auctioneer comes onto the front and the auction starts. The auctioneer essentially um, has only really been to the property on the morning of the auction. Auctions normally take place on Saturday mornings, sometimes Sundays, and the auction then commences. So let's say after half an hour, the, the buyer has been, uh, has, 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 has been successful and they will walk into the house with the auctioneer and the listing agent where the owners will be sitting in the front room waiting for their buyer to arrive. The buyer will arrive, the contracts will be signed, the deposit will be wired, and then two weeks after that, the home will be transferred to the buyer. So it's a six weeks process. It sounds now, like the dating our listeners, game. It literally our sounds listeners like the dating game where you this. have these guys outside and then, they, and then yeah. come meet your seller. That's right. And they have, they have TV shows, they have TV shows about this um, regularly on TV. There's, there's you know, they're, they're, I think one's called The Block. Um, you know, it, it, it's essentially, it has become mainstream. Then the person who devised this way back 28 years ago or so is a chap called John McGraw. Now, John McGraw is a friend of mine. He's an absolutely fantastic broker. He started in his early 20s and started a real estate company called McGraw. And if you look up McGrath, it is now the third largest real estate business in Australia. And he is the person that pioneered the auction process, took it out of that sort of, which in the rest of the world um, is kind of a dirty word, if you like. It's normally associated with foreclosures. And so therefore, you know, it was the same in Australia probably 30 years ago, but he changed that process to build, to bring that process to people to say, it's not. It, 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 when you have a, a number of people who are interested in a property and there is needs to be a, a, a finite decision on timing, it is the best option to go for, for both the Sounds seller and the property. very efficient. Yeah. I love the very idea efficient. that there is a fine, a beginning and an end yes. and, and an it's end. predefined right. and the contingencies yeah. are pulled out and that yeah. I can give some assurance to my seller uh, when it'll sell and that it'll be given um, a fair shake in the market, and the market that, will, will the market will speak. What are some of the fault? What are some of the problems? Maybe they don't always sell. The problem is, is that you need to have a buoyant market in which that to function really well. So when you get a downturn in the market, which we've been having with 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 the problems with interest rates over the last year, you tend to have very low clearance rates. So the clearance, a high clearance rate would be around 80, 85% on a weekend, which means that 85% of those properties that went to auction had a successful auction and there was a transaction. In the times where you get the, 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 the sort of the bear markets, if you like, you tend to get around a 50% clearance rate, which essentially means that 50% of those properties they did not have a successful auction. Now the issue can the is- Can the seller cr create a minimum price? Yes, they can put a reserve in. Um, absolutely they can. Um, sometimes they don't, sometimes they do. Mainly the reserves are um, attributed to financing. So if you have a problem, if you have a property which is 50% finance or 60% finance, you're gonna have a number that you know you have to reach um, above that in order for the property to sell because obviously you cannot have a situation where your the seller is still going to owe money to the bank why um, and so, yeah why does this not reduce the role of the broker to really a commodity 
where it, if I you have are, a, John, you're absolutely right. It's almost like a concierge person, right? You're actually a facilitator because you're not actually broking anything. All you're doing is providing a process. Now, this is one of the issues that I had being a real estate broker, starting my business in Switzerland for 15 years, where I ran a, a large real estate uh, company in, 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 the, in, the, in the town of Gstaad, uh, which is a ski resort similar to Aspen in the Swiss Alps. And I was, you know, that's how I cut my teeth in 2000. I was a broker, I built a business, and that's how I knew, knew how to sell real estate in, in the traditional way that we would do it in New York, what's called here private treaty which essentially is that you go to market, you have a six weeks, con a six month contract, and you have multiple people visiting the property, open houses or private, uh, or, or, or private viewings. And essentially you get a deal together within that period of time. So coming to Australia, it was a very different way of operating. And my skill set um, is, 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 is not really needed in this, in, in this sort of under $5 million um, uh, price tag, if you like. Now, above $10 million, which is about 7 million US, absolutely, you need to have people who are, you know, who are used to the process of broking or selling between two different parties. You have to have that skill set because you're not able to really do an auction. Now, auctions in COVID started to escalate. There was an auction that happened with a property in a very, very a smart area on the Sydney Harbour. Um, this house sold for $25 million. It started the auction at 12 <laughs> mm. because there was such a huge demand for this property. And because of COVID, they thought the best way to operate this, obviously there was partially online. Some people who were able to get to the property got to the property, but it was a kind of quasi online and um, and real time, um, you know, on uh, physical uh, on the premises. And because there were so many interested buyers, I think from memory there were twelve registered buyers. That doubled its price. Now that is very unusual. Um, but at that time, it was a it was a record breaker. They'd never seen that before. So we've started to see the auction process slowly creep above the five million uh, level now um, since COVID. But essentially, it's not as mainstream above five million as it is under five million. I mean, any real estate broker um, or real estate agent, as they uh, label here, um, will really give the seller no other option other than auctioning their property. Um, so, under so, five million. so um, you're saying about eighty percent of the deals are done by auction. Eighty percent of the clearance rate. So, if you have an on any Saturday. In New South Wales, which is where Sydney is, you've probably got somewhere around about somewhere between two to four thousand properties which are being auctioned. And so the clearance rate of 80 percent comes from the amount of auctions which are successful. OK, so as a, as a seller, I want to sell my property. Yes, you're going to advise me probably say you're going to do this by auction. But what are my other options? And so your other options, you have two other options. One is private treaty, which is how we do it in New York, right? And the other one is expressions of interest, which is essentially you get sell, you get buyers going to the property. There is a finite date when they accept um, uh, bids which are sealed. Okay, so the same process happens. They the 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 the, the, the buyer will go to the property. They'll view it. They'll see it. Um, they'll take the contract away with them. They'll send it to their attorney. And then they will decide what they feel is the right price to offer for that property. Now, don't forget that in every certain, every situation here, there is a guide price. And the guide price is basically a 10% above and, and uh, sorry, is, is, is around about, let's say the property has a guide price of um, the, the, the owner wants to get a million dollars for their property. The guide price would be then 900 to $1.1 million. So that would be the guide, if you like, where you go into. That is not shown on the internet. So if you go and look for a, a property which you want to buy on the MLS here, which is um, run by, um, which is a murder, which is a, a news court product called um, 
realestate.com.au, which is the number one portal, a bit like Perch World or Street Easy, where you can go online and you can see all the listings at any one time. Very, very seldom do they have the guide price. They will not advertise the price on the listing. So it forces the, the, the buyer to contact the agent to find out how much, what the guide price is. So once the guide price is, is, um, is, is, is understood and that person has seen the property, they will do a sealed bid before the end date for the expressions of interest. And those will be presented to the seller at a, on a finite date, usually in the listing a, a agent's office, where let's say there might be five or three, depending on how um, you know interest, how how sort of um, you know interested parties are on the property, and then that the the owner would open up those sealed bids and then decide which one he was going to accept. Sometimes, if it's a little bit, you know, it's a lesser amount than the than the seller would like. There is potential there for negotiation. So essentially they would take the highest bid or the or, or the better or the or the you know best and final if you like. And then they would go back to that attorney and discuss that they could accept that, but they would maybe have to get to a number which was slightly increased. And that's essentially how the uh, the expressions of interest um, system works. So there are three so, main ways to sell your property here. So I have so many questions. One is uh, do you have much of an off market kind of market where private sales, you know, just word of mouth? Yes. So we do. So I, when I, one of my first um, job, if you like, in, in Sydney, when I arrived in 2020, is I um, contacted a guy called Ken Jacobs. Now, Ken Jacobs is a bit of a legend over here. He's been in the market for over 50 years. He's sold more property than any agent um, in Australia. And he's hit all the big, um, the big numbers. He's, he's one, of, one of only two people who have sold properties over $100 million. Um, on the Sydney Harbour um, and actually done several of those. So I contacted Ken completely out of the blue and um, we got on very well. And I started, I hung my license at Christie's um, when I first started here. Now, Ken does most of his deals off offline, uh, on, you know, off market. You, you don't even know the properties that he's doing because essentially um, he has got, um, you know, a number of the high worths, including high net worths, including the Murdoch family, who will decide they want to offload a property. They don't really want anyone to know about it, but he's on the other side going to know another high net worth individual who would like to buy that property and the deal is done offline. So there are a number of deals which you don't even get to hear about. And then suddenly, maybe a two or three weeks later, you hear about it in the press because a journalist has found out about it and there's usually a no comment. So, yes, there are. But okay. on, in the level, in the level under $5 million, no. Most properties go through this process because it really has become mainstream. And it really works for both buyer and seller, especially if you've got a family who need to move into a new property, um, you know, and there is a timing issue. This is the best way to achieve that, especially in a market which is a buoyant market. Um, I mean, we can talk about the market conditions now, but maybe you want to um, in a minute. I still that. have a couple of questions. We've been talking a yeah. lot about seller representation. What about buyer representation? How do the commissions work? So, an agent here essentially decides whether they're going to become a listing agent or a buyer's agent. Okay. In fact, the the, the regulatory body in New South Wales, uh, New South Wales Fair Trading, allows a broker, a real estate agent, to do both. But the only thing you can't do is both at the same property. Now, there is no dual agency here, so you can't do that. So you can't represent both parties. But what you can do is you can be a, 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 a seller's, you know, a buyer's agent on one property and a listing agent on another. Most people in 95% of the properties decide they're going to be one or the other. So there is a very big buyer's agency um, uh, you, you know, companies. So they're only buyers agents. That's all they do. They don't have any listing agents in the company. So they might have um, 20 real estate ag agents working in a firm, but they're all buyers agents. And then conversely, with the companies like I mentioned McGrath, all of their people are listing agents. So they've really separated both of those parts, which in my opinion, having worked on both is a mistake. And my agency, Kincaid, allows my agents to do both and to advertise themselves both as listing agents and buyers agents. 
purely because I know that in most cases, when people are coming into the business, actually being a buyer's agent um, is really how you really cut your teeth because you've got people, friends and family want to buy something and you represent them. And only after the fact that you get a bit of a reputation, do you get the confidence to list the property? And that's not that's not dissimilar to, to how it works here. The difference is here is if you're getting into the business, you generally join a team. And if you're a, the youngest broker in, 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 in the house, um, you are essentially, and I, and I, I bring myself back and I, I think maybe that podcast, that, that uh, post there that John saw, I, I, was, I was mentioning the fact that when I started in real estate, I, I, and sorry, in my first job out of university, was selling life insurance. And there is a big similarity for the young brokers um, in the way that they try to procure, the way that they try to procure clients in the same way that I used to in the 1980s, try and get clients to buy life insurance policies off me. Essentially, it's cold calling, a heavy amount of cold calling. Those agents are required to do 200 phone calls a day and mark down on a sheet that they do. They then have to keep a, a score sheet, if you like, and they are essentially, that's what they do for eight to nine hours a day. Now, that's not the way that I have started my career in selling real estate. I always started with my network, and then I grew my network and I did it organically. So it's a different way of doing it, but I suppose for the, for the companies that operate out of here, there is no other real choice for them to do because they have to be able to make those, uh, those real estate agents who's coming to the market earn their 5,000 Australian dollars a month because they can't get it back. So once it's sent to that, that new recruit, he doesn't have to pay it back. So what do the, the management do? They put the person to work and that's essentially what they do. So they are the kind of, they're in the engine room of the team to bring those leads. And once those leads come out, generally that agent who may be 23, 25 years old, will not get the chance to actually develop that lead, that will go to a senior broker. So it's a, it's a different way of doing it here. Yeah. And what's the commission rate of like selling So the commission rate is essentially because it's not both sides. So not like in Europe, we get 6% or 5% and we split 50-50. That's not the case here. So there's only one listing, there's only one price. And that's usually somewhere between two and one and a half percent. Sometimes some agents, you know, some of the really hungry agents will reduce that down to 1%, but it's very difficult to make money on that when you're dealing with something half a million, million dollars by the time that you, you yeah. Explain that a little bit better. That You said it's not split. That means it's 2% no. each side still? No, no, there's no each side. So if you've got a listing agent and they're essentially bringing that property to market um, via auction, there is no reason to have a buyer's agent. Now, uh, 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 somebody who is going to maybe go at auction to, uh, you know, to, to go through that process, a, a buyer, he may instruct a buyer's agent to assist him through the process, especially maybe if he's new to the country, um, especially maybe if he feels that he could get a better price by having a better buyer's agent. Um, the buyer's agent would have to be paid directly by the buyer. And so therefore, that generally is somewhere between 2 to 3% of the selling price, but that is solely paid for the, by the buyer. So the, why, the, the why seller- Why would a buyer do that if realtor.com.au is available correct. and exactly. I can browse the properties? And that's why they don't. So they don't, most people don't use a buyer's agents but really come into their own with people who are new to the process of buying real estate in Sydney or a, another city around you know, South Wales or even you know, around Australia. They come into their own because like we do in New York City, we have a great wealth of information to be able to pass on to our, our buyers to guide them through the process. And that's where they come into their element, but not really in an auction process. Because if you've got somebody who's lived in Sydney all their life, they've maybe sold two or three properties, they maybe bought two or three properties, they're not going to need a buyer's agent because they know you the said process. There's entire firms that specialize in, in that's right, there are. But most side. of those firms, most of those firms will be a, will be dealing in property over five million dollars. So they'll be in the sphere, which is not at auction. So when you're going to the expressions of interest or private treaty, 
it may be a good idea to bring in a buyer's agent because essentially that two to three percent you're going to have to pay to them, you're probably going to save in, in their negotiation skills on purchasing the property for you. Is this countrywide? Is this in Adelaide? Is this in Perth? Is this in Melbourne? Everywhere. This is everywhere in Australia, everywhere in New Zealand, and also, interestingly, in South Africa. Wow. Those are the three principal areas of where, um, of where auction is mainstream in the now, property space. I've pulled up the map of Australia on the screen. Where are yep. you and what markets are we talking about? So, okay, so I sit in where you see New South Wales, which is the orange state. You'll see there halfway down the coast is Sydney. And so that's where I live there. Exactly. Yeah. The capital of Australia is Canberra, which, which if you look there underneath the next red one, exactly, it has its own territory, which is called ACT, which is the Australian Capital Territory. Okay, which is a, a, a Canberra was built. Um, now, I'm not sure how many years ago, but I think let's say around 100 years ago, maybe less, which became, which was a purpose built city to hold the seat of government. Because essentially before then, Sydney and Melbourne were the biggest, um, biggest capitals and they could not make up their mind um, which one of them would, would be the would capital city. So they agreed to build a new city almost halfway between them which was called Canberra. And then, Where, we, yeah. Where's the luxury market? Is there a luxury market in Canberra? Oh, yes. Well, yeah, no, not really. I wouldn't say there's a luxury market in Canberra. Um, I've been to Canberra two or three times. My wife is in there every week <laughs> for her work. Um, but it's not essentially, um, it, it's, it, it's, it's predominantly, you know, um, Diplomats um, um, who, who who go there. So every country in the world has got a has got an embassy in there. Well, the majority of them, and so therefore there is a team uh, of Americans and Canadians and and Brits who or, or, would all work in the embassy there, and they would all also also need real estate. But I don't think um, there are, you know, top end luxury like you would see in Sydney or Melbourne. Um, but that's not to say they don't have very large um, ranches outside Canberra. It's it's very um, fertile uh, country. Um, in fact, I know a, a, a family who have a very, very large ranch out there. So there is a lot of ranches, but in the city itself, um, not so many luxury properties. I'm interested in the Gold Coast. Anybody <laughs> who has called them Absolutely. Gold that's Coast a bit, must have a, a good marketing like department. That's a bit like Cancun. That's where all the casinos are. That's where all the big high rises on the beach are. So a little bit like Cancun or Miami. Um, it's that's the kind of that's a bit like South Beach, maybe. That's the kind of vibe that's going on there. Um, really, you know, a lot of sunshine all year round. Um, you know, a lot of luxury, big, big, uh, big condos on the beach. That kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, and Brisbane and uh, Melbourne. What about these other cities? They uh, so the Mel Melbourne. Melbourne is Melbourne is is. Uh, I, I think you the, the way I like to compare them is Melbourne is a bit like New York, and Sydney is a bit like LA, right? So Sydney is much more of a beach culture. The weather's better all year all year round. I mean, we get to tops of 21, 22 degrees in the middle of our winter. Um, so that in that in Fahrenheit's in the 70s, right? Um, so, and then our summers in Sydney go up to around about in the 80s, in the 90s sometimes. And, you know, it, it, it doesn't really get much below 70 degrees. However, in, in, Cam in, 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 in Melbourne, it's got a much more of a, 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 of, a, of a wetter climate. So there's a bit more rain, um, it's a bit cooler. Um, and it's a very sophisticated city. I like Melbourne very much myself. It's a, it's kind of a cafe society, if you like. It's a little bit more um, academic, if you like. Um, a little bit more, if, if a big show is going to come, which has got a, you know, an, 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 an academic edge to it, it'll go to Melbourne. Um, but if you want Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift's coming to Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> So let's let's switch a little bit. I, we talk regionally, like you're in a different quarter of the entire globe than we are. But yes, I hear so many people are coming there, especially if it was particularly from Asia and Vietnam and things like that. There's a lot of money coming yes. from there into. Yes. But where where else is the money coming from and why are people coming? 
well, it, China, for instance, has, has had a massive uptick in people emigrating from China. And I think that's probably quite obvious why. Um, they like the rule of law. The rule of law is, is basically derived from the United Kingdom. You know, the country has only been a country for 120 years. Uh, they federated in 1902. Um, so, it, you know, and, and essentially before there, it was, it's, it was ruled by Great Britain. And so it's got a very good law system here. It's a fair country. It's a safe country. Um, it's a very, you know, it, it is, you know, like all countries, there are, there are issues, of course. But if you're comparing it to China um, and you're somebody who's made good money, there's a very good, you know, there's a, probably a very good reason that you'd like to be able to move here to educate your children um, and, 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 and obviously, you know, to, to give them a, 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 a better way of life, if you like. So with China, it's very much that that's that's been a, a big draw for them to come here. Um, that's and, been one and of the would the would the choice be like go to Western U.S. or go to Australia and Australia is a much better value or. Yes, I think also, and I think also, you know, there is there is somewhat at the moment, sadly, and I do say this sadly, I think there's a little bit of a stigma with the US at the moment. Um, I think it can be viewed as, as a pace when we're looking from outside, you know, guns is, is an issue and it's what we hear a lot about. And, you know, uh, from outside there is, there is, it's expensive. The dollar is super strong at the moment, um, making it very difficult to buy something of any meaningful size, um, you know, and also emigration, it, it can be very difficult. Um, Australia does have a, 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 you know, if you are a professional person, the door is open to come to Australia. It really is. They want to have more professional people. You know, the land mass of Australia is the same as the United States, okay? And in the United States, I think the population is what? 300 million people, something Close like that? Close to 400, I think 350. Okay. Yeah, 350. 25 million people live in Australia. So it's a tenth of the size, right? Most people live on the coast, okay? There are a few people who live in the middle, um, but very few. And so the opportunity here is still pretty good. Um, raw materials, you know, uh, all, all those uh, iron ore, um, well, coal is fizzling out, but, but all those kind of you know, fossil fuels that we still need, we don't want to have, but we still need, it keeps the engine running for Australia. So Australia, essentially, you know, in COVID, um, billions and billions of dollars keeping the show on the road, right? They closed the borders for 18 months, no foreign investment coming in, um, you know, and, 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 and nobody could get inside or out. And within three years, they've managed to balance the budget again. You know, it, it, it doesn't take very long for them to do it because taxation is high here. It's, it starts at 50% over $180,000. So, you know, it, 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 it doesn't take much for the country to repeal their coffers again to start again. So they're always looking for more professionals to come in, families to come in. And they have a rule, and I think it's the same in the U.S., that, you know, if a, if, if a professional couple come in with their kids and they emigrate, then the rest of the family can follow suit after a period of time. So that's very you know, interesting for instance, for a Chinese family or a Vietnamese family or a Korean family who have, who generally have a lot of family members. And so they all generally end up coming here over a period of time. Um, so how are you with, attracting, but how are you attracting the, like one of the things in New York and Connecticut and all those places we're saying, yeah. everybody's, there's a flight because of the taxation. They're going to Palm yes. Beach, they're going to yeah. Texas, you know? Yeah. You have you such have a high here. taxation rate, though. Here. What's the draw? Well, my wife, I mean, she has a fantastic job and she pays a huge amount of tax. But it's, it's, it's I guess it's what you pay for your ability to live here. And, you know, it is a great life, lifestyle. I mean, you know, it, it really is. It's a very different lifestyle. Um, and so there's a big draw for that. And if you have to pay for that, that's just the price of doing business if you want to do that. There are no options of, you know, being offshore or going to Delaware. There are no options like that. It, it, it just, it doesn't exist, you know. Um, 
you know, and, 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 you know, a lot of Australians decide that, you know, they want to go and make their fortunes in the US and they get a great job in New York on Wall Street or whatever. And they spend maybe 20 to 30 years of their life abroad. They make a phenomenal amount of money. And yes, they probably pay a lot less tax. But you know what's interesting? They all come back and then they buy the forever home and then they buy the $25 million home. And then they, you know, they move back in their late 50s or 60s and spend the rest of their life in Australia. So there are the people who don't want to pay that tax um, and feel very strongly about it and, you know, maybe are ready to leave Australia for whatever reason. And they do that. Um, but there is a huge significant amount of people, you know, my wife's family, who all of them have good jobs and all of them pay their tax. And that's just how it is. It's, it's just it's just not it's grumbled about a little bit, but it's it's not like the same in the U.S. where, as you said, you know, people will move from Florida, you know, from New York down to Florida and set themselves up or go to Texas or, you know, for, for, for those great, you know, company incentives. They, they, it just doesn't seem to happen here. And it doesn't make a difference which state you go to. It, it really doesn't. Your federal tax and your state tax is pretty much the same. And as well as your what they call GST here, which is, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the tax added that you would have with go to a restaurant or whatever, or you're buying a product. Yeah. I think, uh, I, so I want to continue on what Roberto is thinking, because I was about to say the same thing. I'm holding up a copy of the Knight Frank Wealth Report. Yes. And in it, they talk a good deal about Australia. And yeah. so I pulled up on the screen uh, some of their predictions. And yeah. I'll just call your attention to the ultra high net worth. Yes crowd in 2022 and australia's got 17,000 very wealthy people in 2022 Correct. but yes. in five and you're in third you're in third place behind china and japan among asian countries but you'll yeah. be down in seventh place and you'll yeah. only gain a few 24,000 yeah. in the next five years and i think yes. it's what roberto is uh getting to which is while your wife has a good job and she and to have that job, she has to be in Australia to have that job. Correct. But the ultra high net worth individuals uh, when choosing where to uh, invest, I think would be and live would be discouraged if they were making one hundred million dollars, giving half of that away in taxes. You're absolutely right. And that's that is exactly that. If you have to work in Australia, you have no choice but to pay the tax. That's why I said that a, a lot of educated Australians um, who finish high school, maybe go to university in the US, they just don't tend to come back. They get a great job, um, you know, and especially now with the new arrangement of AUKUS between Australia um, and the, the US and the UK, we've we've seen a lot of, you know, visa issues which are easing up between those countries now so it becomes easier it's always been pretty easy and as, as an australian to work in the us um that happened at the first gulf war when they got an allocation um of visas which were which were made available to australians in new zealand and the new zealanders and essentially i think that quota is somewhere around about seventy thousand per year um that you know can be can be taken up and the only requirement is is that you work in the same field that you had your university degree. So if you're an attorney and you become an attorney in the University of Sydney and you want to become an attorney in New York City, you can move, no problem. You will be able, able to move, you'll get the visa and you'll have to take the obviously the, the, the different exams that you know the New York bar require you to do, but essentially then you're good to go. So there's a, big, there's a very big, strong um, agreement between the three countries now on that. Um, and and so therefore, there there are a number of Australians who will decide to leave um, Australia, you know, after they've complete their university education and move to the states or move to the UK um, to 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 you know to to do a a, a different job um, and and you know under a different taxation system. Um, but for those people that you know remain in Australia. Um, they'll pay that. Um, for instance, you know, one of the biggest trades here is what we call in Australia, they're called tradies. So they're essentially people who in the trade who come to fix your house, do the plumbing, do the electric. And a lot of them are one man bands with their pickup trucks, which they call utes here. And they've got their entire um, operation on the back, on the flatbed. And they'll go to the house and they'll fix your things, but they will not be discounting. They will not be paying for cash. 
they'll be charging you 100 US, 100, almost, no, I would say about 100 US an hour for the jobs that they do. So there is no, you know, how, how's the best way to say this? There are no illegal people here. It, this doesn't exist. So you don't have a situation like I had in New York City and I needed to get something done into my apartment. There will be someone down the road who knew somebody else who would do it for cash and I could give them 50 bucks and they would do it. That doesn't exist here. So you've got a really vibrant market of people who are putting everything through the channels that they should be doing. And so they're paying their tax, but they are living very good lives. I mean, I had a listing, I'll give you an example. I had a listing um, in Sydney a couple of years ago. I actually had two listings. Uh, one was $8 million and one was $12 million. And the, the, the $8 million listing, I would have people coming to the show, coming to the open house who were in their work boots, they were in their overalls, they had the youth outside. And I was like, and, and I thought to myself, you know, I didn't want to be judgmental, but I thought to myself, is this person really going to be able to buy this house? And when they would show me, you know, before they made their offers or their financials, I was flabbergasted. These people make a hell of a lot of money and they can afford to buy a five or six million dollar house. So let's talk. Let's talk. We have 10 minutes or so left. Let's talk about yeah. that luxury market and how it's changed since COVID. Australia took a rather um, severe policy draconian closed the borders closed <laughs> the borders right. during covid they did. and yeah. what did that do so let's begin with covid what did that do to your luxury market how how was it before the closing of the borders and and, it and was, did it, that it, impact it yes it did because before in 2019 that the the actual real estate market in australia was actually going through um, a bit of a tough time um and it was it, you know it it was pretty lackluster across the board COVID came, beginning of 2000, it was pretty, um, it was pretty severe. Um, they shut down the borders in March of 2020. But by the end of that year, um, and I would say going into September, October, you started to see a massive uptick in the market. And that was across the board, whether it was under $5 million or in the luxury space, it was, it was pretty intense because most people, all the high net worths that are here, and there are a number of them, they started to focus their energies on buying property in Australia. And so therefore it was a captive audience. They literally, those people who may have thought about buying that apartment in New York or, or buying it in LA or London, they were not buying it there because they couldn't get there. And don't forget at the time, we didn't know how long this was gonna last. This could have lasted five years. You know, there, there was, that's the, the pundits out there and the health people were telling us that there was no end in sight. And so essentially people just started to, 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 to rally around the property market. And we saw the prices go up on average between 35 and 40% increase in the 20 and 21 markets. And so there was a lot of transactions that happened. They had never had such a buoyant market since the records even started. What's happened now after the pandemic is that a combination of the interest rates rise and the end of the pandemic where people are traveling again, we've seen that 40%, 35% lose about 20% of value in the market, okay? But we're still above the pre-pandemic levels. So we're still above 19, 2019. But my prediction is, is that we're going to see the market get flooded with investment properties in the next year. And the reason is, is that the mortgage market here is very different than the US. So in the US, you get government backed mortgages of 20 to 30 years, depending on which one you choose to do. And when you're buying your property, maybe when you're starting out and you're buying your first home in, in, in first major home at the age of 30 in the US, you buy your mortgage um, for 30 years and it sticks with you to your 60. And you may change three or four properties in that process, right? And you'll have to pay administration fees, but you'll hold the same mortgage. In Australia, like the UK, if you sell your property, your mortgage goes, okay? It's finished. And so therefore, you have to then start the whole process again. 
Now, don't forget that a year ago, if I was to buy a mortgage in Australia, it would cost me 2% for a, probably a two-year fixed mortgage. Right now, if I go out to the market, it's going to cost me seven, right? And the problem is with that is that, is that that's why the market at the moment is incredibly good in, in Sydney and in other cities, and it's remained very strong. And the reason is, is there's no inventory. So people are still needing to buy properties, but it's keeping the property market at an incredibly um, uh, you know, even keel. You didn't say 30-year mortgage. You said what? So I said, in the US, you get a 20 or 30 year arm, right? Here, your maximum fixed rate for a mortgage is two years. So when you sell your property, now you've had a 2% fixed, you're going to, you want to buy your new property, it's going to cost you 7%. It's going to cost you three times the amount of money that your borrowing did a year ago because of the interest rates. Does everybody have to pick, get a new mortgage every two years? Everybody has to get a new mortgage. Yeah. There's no longer terms in that? No. Why? Because, because the banks are guaranteeing it. The, the, it's not government backed. In I think Roosevelt, after the New Deal, he was the one who introduced Fannie Mae, and F Fannie Mae, right? After the New Deal in the 1930s. Yeah. So he gave that to the people to say, I'm going to give you that assurance for 20 to 30 years, fixed term, so you can buy your property and live in it for the duration of your working life. That never happened anywhere else in the world. Australia looked at it, New Zealand looked at it, the UK looked at it, but they never ratified it. So the banks are the per people that take it. They can't afford to basically give anything more than that because of the interest rates. And that's been very evident now. Because if a bank was to be able to give that at 2%, riding through with this, and then the interest rates don't come down for six or seven years, got a problem. So We're therefore, gonna, two it, minutes. So yeah, let's let's see if we could sum this up. We can we can keep talking after that, but we got about two minutes. So it occurs to me that you had the market got terrific in twenty and twenty one, up thirty yep. percent, up thirty percent. Then it flattened or it went down. Did it correct ten percent? It went down. It ten went down. or twenty? It twenty percent. It was the high was forty in some suburbs. Sydney had a number of suburbs that were forty percent. And it's gone down on average about 20%. But and it's where is it still going? above. And where well, is it going? This is, this is what I'm going to say, is that the majority of those properties that were bought in COVID times were investment properties, right? All on a two-year fixed. The problem is now is that those investment properties are, are going to have to get new mortgages. And they've got tenants in them, but the tenants are not going to be paying another, you know, 10%, 20%, 30% on their more on their rentals because that's not going to be that's not going to be achievable. So what does the owner do of the property who owns that million or two million dollar property who's going to go from two percent to seven percent borrowing by the end of this year? They're going to have to put the property on the market and sell it. So we're going to see or jack a big up the amount rents. of or jack yes, up the but rents. not that much. I don't think they can put the rents up that much. So it, it, they cannot be in a situation where they're losing money, okay? So they'll, they'll put them on the market. So we're going to see an increase of inventory. And then you know what happens crisis. with that? We're going to see a crisis. Well, we could be seeing a crisis. You're absolutely right. Which is I a good buying a, opportunity for wealthy people. Which is people a great buying opportunity right for wealthy. All cash, absolutely. Fantastic opportunity. Guys, we're so gonna it's going to be interesting to see what happens. On this, All right. Because yep. we have not talked about <laughs> the geographical area of Sydney, what's Jervis Bay, et cetera. We haven't gotten there. Yes. We're going to have and to I want do to a part thank two. Roberto for putting this together. I would like to thank Dominic Longcroft. This has been very illuminating. Stay tuned for part two on the Sydney show. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. All right. Can that, we hang? That's that it. Ends. That's it for All Voice clear. Great show, guys. We can continue talking. Thank you. Can, can we, John, can we, because I noticed you recorded late, can we just do the beginning? I can splice in the beginning. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Great show. Thanks. I don't want to talk more unless we're going to record it. <laughs> we got to do a part <laughs> two. We got to do the whole, you know, we're, what's around the harbor? Why is that? What these, you know, these yeah. suburbs, what do people do? Do they commute? Do they this? Do they that? What are the taxes when you buy? We haven't gotten any of that. <laughs> Okay.
we do have to do a part two. All right, we'll do a part two. Dominic, amazing amount of information. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to happy to educate it. it I've been here almost four years now, so it's um it, it it it's very interesting. I find it fascinating. It is such a different market than what I was used to in New York. It really is. And but it's also great to be able to you know still be tuned into New York and then to be able to help my agents here to be able to understand how to how to build their markets in a different way. I mean, is, every few minutes you brought yeah. up a new piece of information that is really mind blowing for the typical American agent who's watching this show. The fact that you have the emphasis on auction, the fact that you have that you treat buyer agents and seller agents so differently, the fact that you have a guaranteed draw for and therefore 20 three-year-olds, 25-year-olds enter the business. And yeah. some of that appealed to me and it sounds very attractive. This is a way we yeah. could we could encourage more young participation in the business in yes. America. But then yeah. I could begin to see some of the challenges with that yeah. and yeah. what and, and what happens in order to yeah. pay that bill. Uh, one of the one of the one of the main problems is is the, the 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 transactional side to it. Now, obviously, you know, being real estate brokers as we all are, there is the transaction that you want to do, and we're not doing this for free. But the problem that has that I have seen with the younger generation coming in, they are so hungry and so aggressive that they tend to hound sellers in a way that I've never seen before. Some sellers have spoken to me saying they're getting upwards of 10 phone calls a day, um, trying to people to, 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 to convince them to sell their house. And the only reason they are is because on that block where they live, one house is decided to sell and they target every single house within 20 houses of that particular house that's gone on the market, convincing them to sell. And they almost literally have to disconnect their phones. It's 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 really intense, um, and wow. so therefore that's something which is the 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 sort of the the dark side, if you like, of that problem is that the companies are making these young agents literally like working in a sweatshop, and I, and that's something that I really have difficulty with. It especially becomes very difficult difficult for women who are in those business businesses and that's how they're, they're operating. Um, and then they decide to get married, they decide to have children. And it's, it's really not in the interest of the company to be able to keep people on like that anymore because they don't have 100% of their time that they can dedicate to their, their real estate business. They've got a child to bring up, whatever. So I've had a number of women come to me um, and I've helped probably 10, 15 of them to transition into different businesses and help them to sort of look at it in a different way um, because it's really challenging. They just can't operate in that. And also it's quite a male dominated market, which is very different than the U S as you know, um, I would say it's probably there are almost maybe now more women brokers than there are the men. Whereas here it's still probably only 10% of the market. And so it's, it's very differently operated. And so I think there are some major positives, but there are also some negatives which come along with that. Although you credit Roosevelt and the New Deal and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for um, providing that stability in the market, yeah. I would say that a key component is the mortgage-backed security. And yes. the fact that we sell these mortgages, we bundle these mortgages and we yeah. sell them into the bond market. And two things happen. The guys down on Wall Street sell them to people on a pension. And therefore, they yeah. know they're going to get a 7% return for the next 10 years, 20 yeah. years. So they buy that mortgage. And Fannie yeah. Mae and Freddie have have uh, set the standard by which uh, that you know, those, those mortgages have to meet a certain quality. Otherwise, they become, you know, junk mortgages. So if they're of a certain quality, uh, therefore, you know, that that's why we had a crisis in 2008, because we were no that's longer right. meeting the standard. Yeah. But when the financial system is working, uh, that 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 uh, that 30-year mortgage translates into many 10-year and 20-year bonds. Yes. I don't understand why... Australian mortgages couldn't be uh, issued longer term, bundled, 
and sold as in, into the bond market? I, I just, I, it's a good question. And I, and I don't have the answer for you, John, because I just, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not able to understand the intricacies of that. But I do know that it's, you know, at the moment, um, the people, as usual, who are really winning on this is the banks. I mean, it is, it is, it is phenomenal, the profits that they're recording at the moment in the last year. Um, and there's no downside for them, really, because after two years, I mean, I think maybe you can get a three year. I, I know this because I did a lot of research into this. My wife has an investment apartment. Um, and so therefore, I've been, you know, talking to a number of banks on this. And it seems to me, you know, most of the banks only offer, a, you know, a two year fixed. And, you know, my wife is coming off her two year fixed in the next uh, year. And we will have to seriously look at it and we'll have to look at whether it is better to actually pay off the mortgage or whether it's better to stay in the mortgage. Um, and so, you know, it, it is a real challenge. And when you've got an investment property, which you've bought probably at 80 percent that you, you, you on, on, on a mortgage, I don't see how you can hang on to it if you're suddenly your fixed rate goes from 2 percent to 7 percent. It's just not feasible to do that unless you've had such an incredible two years that you've made enough money to pay off the entire mortgage and do that. Now, in some cases, maybe that's the case, or at least a 50 percent reduction that they'll do in the, well, in, in the, in the mortgage. In, so in, it, all, it, yeah. no, in all fairness, uh, that Australia has never experienced a run up in interest prices that we have experienced in the last two years. So they've never really been tested to this extent. Correct. But the, but the interest rates are the same here as they are in the US. I mean, they, they basically, it's almost a mirror image of every single time the Fed would put up theirs. So did, the, so did the, the central bank here, the same thing. And we're almost, I think, at about the same level. Um, I think we're- But, we're, we're, but we're for an entire- for, industry, we, seem to have, we seem to have more optionality of how to, how to yes. maneuver than you do. Correct. So you have you 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 have fluidity in the property market. So if somebody wants to sell their house that's on a twenty year twenty year arm mortgage, you know at the end of it they still can do that because the, the mortgage is unaffected, right? The difference is here is it's a huge deal for someone to sell the house. So who has been benefiting? Those tradies I was talking about. They are building extensions. They're going up. They're going the side. They're making a basement. All the construction around the place is absolutely at the all time high because people are taking small mortgages, small loans in order to facilitate those. So they're taking 100,000 or 200,000, maybe 300,000 to do that bit, but that's nothing compared to the $2 million mortgage that they have, which you know, at the end of the day is fixed for the moment. Um, but it's, it's very tough. So we're going to see, I think by the end of the year, we're going to start to see a very different market than what we have now. And that I think almost certainly there's gonna be a lot more inventory in the market. Mm. It's some of the same volatility that we're seeing in the commercial market in the United States, and it's being it's being led by San Francisco. A lot of stories being written about San Francisco, but yeah. also in New York, where commercial paper is coming yeah. due and can't yeah. be refinanced at the same yeah. rates, and therefore it's a crisis in the commercial space. Um, What's interesting to me is whether that crisis in your residential space, as a result of not being able to finance long term, whether that uh, changes the inventory picture. Here, people don't want to give up their low interest loans and trade no. into a 7% loan, so they no. hold property off the market. It'll be interesting right. if you do start to see an avalanche of property on, uh, of inventory as a yeah. result of financial policy. Yeah, I think so. It's going to be a very interesting market. And I just wanted to add one thing, which um, I was talking to Roberto about, you know, some what's happening on the west side of, of this country. Perth, for instance, has seen no reduction in that pre um, in, in, after COVID. Uh, there's been a huge uptick in property. And I'm just going to read something that says the only market affected by the downturn and not to be affected by the downturn. Um, and the increased values. Perth population is growing, contributing to the heightened demand for housing, pushing up market prices, and people are flocking to the city. Demand for new homes, rental properties has been on the rise, causing a soar. So even though in Sydney, where we started to see these declines, is mainly the reason is that 
the 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 Sydney and the Melbourne markets obviously are incredibly sought after. And in Perth, it's 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 still a you know it, it is a sought after market, but nowhere near the same as Sydney and Melbourne. And so what we've started to see is that there are a lot of people who are starting to see that as value. They're starting to see that as maybe an option to go and relocate to, to start a new job to. And, you know, and, and, and Perth has been the benefactor of that. So they haven't seen those decreases of those 20% declines that we've seen over in Sydney and Melbourne. And Perth, I mean, I've never been myself. My wife has been there, but it's, you know, beautiful beaches. You see the sunset because you're in the West. Um, and it's a really growing city. Um, also a very wealthy state. Western Australia is one of the wealthiest states in Australia because of all the mining. Wow. All right, yeah. part two. When can we put part two on the We're calendar? gonna find a date soon. But we should find a date yes. soon because we should kind of pair them up. Yeah. Thank you, Dominic. Yeah. Thank Dominic, you. Roberto. Thank you. Great to see you. This is great. Great to see friend. you too. Skipper, take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.